Before I think of it, we get into things. Thank you very much for that very kind letter. Well, letter. Goodness, I think Most we great. all we all felt that you know when a president uh, uh, gets confronted like that, why well, <laughs> he belongs to everybody. <laughs> I was, as I told you, I was out in my native Iowa there in the, the morning coffee around the square. Why, they were, there weren't Democrats or Republicans, they were all Americans, well, so they were, they were all delighted, I must say. Uh, well, listen, I just have a few questions here that you start in again. I, uh, how do you feel? That's the first You're fine. one. Really? Uh -huh. Every day I'm amazed at the improvement. It just, uh, only a few days ago that uh, uh, to bend in the middle, somebody had to help. <laughs> I now I can <laughs> get up all by myself. The sore spot's going away. Oh, uh, yeah. Sort of it's, thing. Uh -huh. it's kind of a, about an 11 inch line there. That <laughs> I see. You don't plan to show your scar like no, Lyndon Johnson. No. Uh, <laughs> to keep that quiet. Huh? Well, let me, on a serious note, uh, uh, you've got another adversary now, cancer. And I just, uh, how are you going to deal with that these next three and a half years? Well, I'm going to do exactly what they've told me to do. The thing is, Hugh, in this one, uh, the doctor himself was a little concerned because he'd used the term that I have cancer. He says the proper thing is I had cancer. And very to a minor effect, that particular polyp called the adenoma type is one that if it is left, it begins to develop cancerous cells. Well, this one had, when they got it out, they found that there were a few of such cells. Mm -hmm. But it's gone, and uh, along with surrounding tissue, it had not spread, no evidence of anything else. So I am someone who does not have cancer, but like everyone else, I'm apparently vulnerable to it, and therefore there will be a schedule of checkups to, for a period to, to see if it's going to return or if there was a cell that had escaped into the bloodstream or something and uh, Will so the fear on. of cancer intrude into your life though? It will... No, I, I, uh, I've never been that way about uh, things of that kind. I just... Uh, well, I must say, the... twice you've been brushed by death since you've been in this office and you seem unfazed. What, uh, you, uh, you keep going, you keep your hope up. What is it? Well, I have a very real and deep faith. Uh, probably I'm indebted to my mother for that. Uh, and I figure that uh, he'll make a decision and, mm -hmm. and I can't doubt that whatever he decides will be the right decision. That's not going to phase your work? No. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. President, if something if the thing should reoccur, if cancer should show up and you had to undergo treatments, is there the possibility that you would resign? Turn the job over? I can't board? foresee anything of that kind, and that is not just me talking. Now, that's on the basis of all that I've been told by the doctors who mm. were all concerned with this. Uh, I can't see anything of that kind coming, but as I said once uh, when we were talking about my age before I was elected the first time, if I found myself ever physically incapacitated to where I in my own mind knew I could not fulfill the requirements, uh, I'd be the first one to say so and mm -hmm. step down. Did you, sus or rather, when was the hardest moment in this whole episode for you? The hardest moment? Mm -hmm. uh, golly, I, <laughs> that's pretty hard to think. The most difficulty I have is uh, in that period in which time disappears and you're no longer a part of the world <laughs> <laughs> under the beautiful. anesthetic yeah. and you came out. Uh, I think the most difficult time I had was uh, uh, trying to reorient as to where I was and had I been operated on yet or not. <laughs> and they said, oh yes, it's all over. And it seemed to me that time uh, where my memory uh, ended was such that I hadn't been, and uh, it was yet to be, and I was quite confused. I see. You, did you suspect you might have cancer before it was, they told you? No. Uh, this whole thing, and I think, Hugh, really, they've uh, 
they've tried to make something of the scheduling of these things. The pileup that had been taken out, the knowledge that I had another one yet mm. to come out, uh, those were the kind that, uh, as they said, uh, don't become cancerous. And the schedule was set, and I went in there fully prepared on a Friday afternoon to have that one snipped out. But then, because there had been a couple, and it had been a time since the last examination, they were going to do this examination then of the intestine to make sure. And I went in fully convinced uh, with a little handbag that I would be on my way uh, to Camp David uh, the next morning, Saturday, stay overnight there uh, to complete this thing. And they came back in after having taken out mm -hmm. the one and told me that they had found this other type. And they said, this other type, we have no evidence whether there are cancer cells, but it is the kind that if left alone does become uh, cancerous. And they said, now, you're all prepped. You're here. Uh, and that prepping took a lot of uh, imbibing of <laughs> certain fluids uh, for hours before I went there. And they said, uh, you can schedule this to come back. Or and I said, our advice is you're all ready and you're here and why not now? And uh, I said, yes. I didn't want to get back on that fluid again a week or two <laughs> from now. I so um, I said yes, and then they told me, uh, when I was able to understand, that um, yes, there had been a few cancer cells in it, but it had not penetrated the outer wall, was confined, there was no trace of this going any place else, mm -hmm. and uh, as the doctor said, uh, so therefore all you can say is you had cancer. Well, now, I'm, uh, I've got too many friends and uh, even my brother who, uh, good Lord, he had very severe a cancer of the larynx. He was a very heavy smoker, mm -hmm. which I have never been. Yeah. And, uh, but that was, golly, I guess the neighborhood of 20 years ago. And uh, he's doing just fine. So uh, uh -huh. I'll take the checkups that they recommend for them to keep track and... Well, it was, there was some comment when you only spent five minutes with the doctors when they told you that the, the specimen was cancerous that they took out, you yeah. know, but uh, there was, uh, that was all you needed to spend with them, huh? Yeah, they I were see. most reassuring. I see. Uh, you, I guess, have answered somewhat indirectly, but let me put it again, you're not unhappy with their medical advice? Oh, no. Not at all. Why didn't you do it last year, 84? Well, I think this is what has been yeah. uh, misplayed somewhat. We didn't know about this potential one. We knew at the time that there were two small polyps, mm -hmm. one much smaller than the other. And uh, they had gotten this one, and then subsequently we set a time later uh, when I would go back in, and there was this talk of uh, the concern about uh, blood. Mm -hmm. Well, that was all dismissed because I took uh, the further tests and examinations on that mm -hmm. and very thoroughly and there was never another trace. And you, I, I don't know, I'd, I'm a little embarrassed at talking as boldly as <laughs> your colleagues do about all of these uh, plumbing secrets and everything, but uh, I think I had an explanation for the very minute trace of blood that just yeah, once turned up in that examination. And uh, my explanation is it was external. Oh, I see. That uh, mm -hmm. I, had, uh, I had irritated sure. myself mm -hmm. externally sure. and uh, had evidence of it. I see. I see. that I could see myself. Mm -hmm. And I thought that is where that trace came from and the very fact then that all the things of special diet and everything else and several times a day samples and so forth uh, over a period of time and never another trace, uh, I think I'm right. I see. Have any of your priorities changed because of this illness as far as being President of America of the United States goes? 
No. Um, if there was any change, it was back in 1981 with the uh, indication of mortality after the shooting that I made up my mind that uh, those things that I believed in doing uh, for whatever time I might have left. Uh, so it's full speed ahead. Yeah. Work is your answer in a way. Yes. I see. One of the things that's been commented on, Mr. President, is Mrs. Reagan, who was, as you said in your speech, yes. remarkable in this. Has she become more of the presidency in these last couple of weeks, or are we just noticing it? No, but um, Nancy is a mother hen. <laughs> and uh, let something happen to one of the family and they become the chick. And uh, no, what she is doing is, uh, uh, she's very concerned that uh, there be no overdoing and being a doctor's daughter and uh, a surgeon's daughter, as a matter of fact, uh, she is very insistent that no one's going to overwork me. And uh, that includes me because she knows that I tend to uh, uh, take such things a little lightly. And uh, <laughs> I think she reached her high point this morning. You know, she's on her way to Denison. Oh, yes. in Ohio at the University there for this uh, program on drugs. She'll be back today. But um, by on the table by my side of the bed, there is one of those little cabbage-type dolls in a nurse's uniform. <laughs> and she has named it Nancy and has put it there. So for while she's <laughs> gone, it is to remind me that <laughs> yeah, I am to do all those things like rest and so forth. Well, she's displayed great courage, as yes, she you has. know, before the, yes. before the world, really, in that time. Yeah. And, uh, and it hasn't been easy because, as she herself admits, she is a warrior. Mm -hmm. And uh, she has been through uh, a lot, uh, including the most traumatic experience, the death of her father. Mm -hmm. And that was, she was there and with him for a couple of weeks there in the hospital. And, both knew that he was dying. And uh, then to have what happened to me, I think I recovered far more quickly than she did mm -hmm. from the shooting. And then along comes a thing like this. Uh, mm -hmm. She's, she can't. Had her share of it. Yeah. Can't quite, her, can't resolve her concern. Mm -hmm. There was a little comment, Mr. President, about your staff and whether Mr. Regan assumed too much power and... Uh, no. He uh, was carrying out things that I said and this whole mix up you and whether uh, uh, George was uh, shipped away or something. No. And I'm delighted talking to you because I know you're fair. When I found out that to be under a, a anesthetic that I should designate and I designated of course automatically George mm -hmm. Bush but George had just come back from that very successful but also very tiring trip. And knowing that this was just for the hours of, a, of an operation, and at this time was all going to be over on, on Friday afternoon uh, when we did this thing, I said to Don, I said, I knew that George had gone as I would have gone to the ranch after that trip, had gone up to Maine. And I said, tell George though that to stay where he is. There's no need, he's, he's as much in contact there as he, uh, as he would be here. I said, tell him to stay there and not to break up his weekend simply because I'm gonna have this little thing snipped. So this was my order. But then when the subsequent thing came along and it was going to be uh, extended hours, it was George's decision to come back and he just said he just felt that under the circumstances, and he was right, that it just would not uh, look right in the eyes of anyone uh, for me to be there and him to be up there and in Maine. And uh, so he felt that, that it uh, would be much more reassuring to the people and everything else. He came back and 
That was all. There was a, there was, I was the one who in the very beginning had said to him, I don't want you to give up your weekend. And you think and, Don Regan's function as the man coordinator in that? And yes, and, and with all the things here, the Don, yeah. Don's carrying out uh, the things that I have said. I've uh, witnessed no grabs for power on the part of anyone. I just, Hugh, there seems to be a concerted effort and has been for the last four and a half years to try and build feuds uh, within the administration. I think they thrive on, some do, on combat, and uh, there just isn't anything to it. Well, you, you've got to have a feud or two, Mr. President, or we'd be out of work. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have more unemployment on your hands. <laughs> you uh, uh, talked of going home. I was struck by it in the hospital. You mentioned it two or three times, how you wanted to go home and get into your bed. I've never heard a president talk of the White House with such affection and warmth. Now, what's the change? This has become well, home. Yes, and Hugh, I think again, uh, we go to, uh, uh, Nancy is a nest builder. You know, if, if we stop in a hotel for a couple of days, she can't be in a suite for five minutes until she's moving the furniture around. <laughs> and uh, to make it more home-like, in the hospital there for only those several days. Uh, she brought pictures up and some large framed photos that we have, her trying to give the dog a bath and so forth and hung them on the walls. There wasn't a picture on the walls of that room. And at first I kept saying, honey, I'm gonna be, you know, out of here in a few days. You're going to a lot of trouble. But I have to say she was right. Suddenly uh, it was much more pleasant and to uh, look around and she had framed photos that, family photos that she brought and were around the place. She does that in the same, uh, same here with the, uh, so it has become home, despite the, yes, the, the I, living, living over the store and the isolation yeah, and all the problems. The living quarters there, our own furniture in there, and uh, I, I just always have had a tendency to settle in. And uh, Maybe you uh, want a third term. <laughs> I think that's out of line now. I think that's but uh, I have to say, uh, no, it is, mm -hmm. it is home. home. Yeah. And she's done the same with the house at Camp David, the yeah. place that, that's, similar to when we had a house in Los Angeles and, a, and the ranch. Mm -hmm. One final question, Mr. President here. What's your favorite joke about your operation? <laughs> oh, Lord. Surely you've told one or two. That cartoon you mentioned this morning. <laughs> oh, well, yes, there was a, there was a cartoon that came out <laughs> and I, somebody brought me a copy of it. Uh, I guess it was in the Times and I, I called him to, to thank him for it, but uh, also to give him a little warning. Well, it's a cartoon that appeared in the paper and it was of the hospital. And then up here in a window was a nurse and a man. And the nurse was very angry and she was pointing down, where out of sight, below the cartoon. And she's saying, that crazy clown down there chopping wood, he'll wake the president. And the man looking down says, that fellow chopping wood is the president. <laughs> and uh, so I showed it to everyone, but he had quite a cartoon figure for the nurse. And uh, these nurses were all very trim and, uh, <laughs> and nice people and all, and uh, they were a little disturbed by the image of a Bethesda nurse. So when I left, uh, the hospital up there, I told all of them. Now, that's what I was saying when I turned my back and was talking to them, I was telling them that I was going to do my utmost to see that the image uh, as portrayed was corrected in, <laughs> in the cartoon industry and that uh, they were not properly portrayed. So I told him that when I called him. Oh, I see. <laughs> Mr. President, I'm going to take that admonition. This is just wonderful. It gives me a feel for it and you've been frank and, and I say right on now. Uh, I guess one final thing, your purposes in the presidency, your priorities uh, basically have not changed. No, that? no they haven't. Budget, tax reform, peace, strength abroad. Yeah. You'll go to see Mr. Gorbachev. 
Yeah. Uh, as far as you know, that's set. And yes. Yeah. No, all of those things. The you I have felt for a long time that even if there were no deficit, mm -hmm. the the federal government, out of a number of things and with the best of intentions, embarked on all kinds of programs, some of which are just not the proper function of government. The government shouldn't be doing, and some of which, uh, even if it's doing them, they're not cost effective at all. Uh, job training programs in which the training was given, but the placement rate of people in jobs was extremely low. And for the cost of training that was enough to send them to the finest university in the land. Uh, things of that kind. Things that we discovered in our own welfare reform. And part of it, the advantage, you of seeing it from that state level out there as governor. The federal programs mandated in local and state government. And even if you were given some say in the administration of those programs, you were so bound in and restricted by regulations and red tape that time after time you found yourself saying, we could do this program twice as well and at half the price if we weren't bound by these restrictions. Mm -hmm. And yet, here was the government saying, you can't change. You've got to do these things this way. Well, I made up my mind when I came here that just what we, we'd done what we could at the state level. Our welfare reform uh, in California was tremendously successful and it didn't throw people out into the snowdrifts or take away from those who had real need at all. But when we found people that under some of those programs, we found people that were say two and a half times their income, outside income, the poverty rate, and were eligible for as many as four mm. federal aid programs. Yeah. You said, we don't think this is what was intended. And so now, uh, I still, as I say, if there were no deficit, still be I want to see get yeah. government to where it should be. And a president said it before me in 1932, Franklin Delano Roosevelt in campaigning said the federal government, the, one of his purposes would be to restore to the states and local communities and to the people authority and autonomy that had been unjustly seized by the federal government. I see. Well now, uh, Mr. Uh, Gorbachev, you up to him? Yes, you, you think looking forward to he's it. He's a young fellow and uh, quite vigorous. Uh, yeah, but I'll try not to take advantage of him. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Well, listen, you're huge. looking great. I must say, how reassuring that is to all of us. You always look better than I feel. I don't know how you do, how you manage that, but and the fact that I heard that you were your color was a little uh, off because you hadn't been the sun, but you looked the same to me. I, I thought I did too. I wasn't in there long enough to lose what tan I had, and uh, I couldn't. And that they even suggested a limp. Well, you, I've been limping since 1949. After I smashed my thigh in that charity baseball game oh, out in Hollywood, oh, this leg came out a little bit shorter than this one. Yeah. And I try to hide it and walk straight, but I can't conceal. I have yeah, a slight yeah. limp. You know, I, uh, you see that piece I did on, uh, on George uh, Ward? Oh, in yes. Time. I got a letter from Joy Hodges. Uh, and she said, you know, I'm sorry you couldn't mention me in there, but she didn't say that. She just said, I want you to know how it all started. I called George, and I said, yeah, we all know that, and they all, but I had the space limitations, so I couldn't, uh, mm -hmm. couldn't uh, get it all in. Oh. So I, and, but then I wrote her, I wrote her a note back, I said, I hope you'll forgive a fellow Iowan. Well, I got another letter back, and she is performing. She told me how delighted she was that she was performing in some summer stock up there. Ginger Rogers was the director oh, and the producer, and she was just having a big time. Oh, she was and, a wonderful gal. Yeah. She really was. And then I went home. I was in Iowa last week, and I, there was a Hodges family in my town. And they said, no, that's related. They're, they're cousins. Yeah. So I had to write her another letter. <laughs> yeah. But she is the one. You know, I had never met her. When I went yeah. to the station, she was gone to she Hollywood. She was gone. She'd gone. And she'd there. been in some pictures, and yeah. she was singing with Jimmy Greer's orchestra at the Biltmore yeah. Bowl. So when I made the deal with the studio that I wouldn't take a vacation if they would send me with the Cubs 
on their spring training trip since I was going to broadcast baseball. Uh, the first trip out there, everybody at the station kept saying, you've got to look up Joy. You've got to look see Joy. So I did. Yeah. And uh, I'll be done. the second, then by then I knew her, so the second time out, uh, spring training, looked her up again. She was singing that at that time at the Biltmore. So that's where the Cubs stayed when we came back from Catalina. So I went down and she came out and had dinner with me in the Biltmore Bowl and then had to go back to the band. Well, we had a hillbilly orchestra that uh, uh, had been uh, picked up for a, a Western. What's his name? Uh, the ball, what was the ball club? Uh, um, oh, my very good friend, uh, the Western star. Ball club, Gene Autry? Gene Autry. Gene Autry, yeah. That had to... uh, he, at that time, was in the country. He'd hire a local radio outfit like ours. Oh, I see. And then, when the, his pictures would play in that area, they'd feature the presence of this particular orchestra. So this one that he'd taken from us was called the Oklahoma Outlaws. And uh, <laughs> he had them, so I went to visit them out at the studio. And I must say, uh, I never had gotten rid of the acting bug in me, so that night, uh, talking to Joy, I said, you know, how does, a, how does a person get in this business and so forth? And, and uh, she didn't Joy. dust me off. She said, uh, well, look, she said, uh, I know an agent and he's very honest. Yeah. And she said, if you want to see him, she said, I'll bet I could arrange and he'll see you, but he said, he'll be the first one to tell you whether you should forget it mm -hmm. or whether to do something about it. And she called uh, George Ward. And, said she got him out of bed early in the morning. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I went to see him, and I'll be done. he took yeah. me out to Warner Brothers. And the uh, next thing I knew, I was having a screen test. Well, she said in her letters that she was having a ball up there. She was back on the stage. Well, I'll be darned. And, uh, she said she'd been down a couple of years ago and had lunch with you or seen you. Yeah, yeah. Well. yeah. But that's great. Oh. Mr. President? Well, thank don't, you. Don't walk away until you're unwired. Until I'm unwired there, okay. That's terrific. Get a little, you get out the ranch here sometime? Then sure. we'll come so along we'll just about the middle of August. Middle of August. The, those jokers on the hill leave again. <laughs> and then I can get out of there. Get them out of time, we're all safer. <laughs> yeah. So, well, I can see, yeah. Great. It's uphill from now on. Good. Yes. Okay. All right. Thanks again, Mr. President.